This tutorial will go deeper into making data-driven prototypes in Framer Web. In this series, I've touched on some simple ways Framer's data can be used, but now we'll really get our hands dirty and see how it's a go-to tool for making feature-rich prototypes. This is Coding with Seth. Let's see what we'll be building. This tutorial series is best viewed in the context of Framer Web. If you're on YouTube, use the link in the description to follow along. Throughout the series, we'll be building out some screens you might see in a mobile banking app. First, I'll explain what the data import from Framer allows us to do and where it might be useful. We'll jump into an example of how it can be used to drive entire interactions like freezing a debit card. Then we'll take a look at a code component we created in another video. Data will be used to persist key pieces of information across renders. We'll see a more complex use of data and overrides used together to make our send money screen more feature rich. Finally, we'll take everything we've learned to create a real transaction page to detail view interaction that's all powered by data. I'll give a brief explanation before we can delve into the code. Anytime you want to store a piece of state, you'll use data, which you can import from Framer. This could be something simple like how many times a button has been pressed but it could be the entire state for a view in your prototype. Its job is to ensure the view updates when the value within data changes. We can see this first hand by taking a look at freezing a card on the home screen. Here's a tip to learn how to use the Framer API. Hover over a symbol like data, and you'll see some documentation on what it does and how to use it. Let's take a look at the overrides that power this freeze card interaction. You'll notice is card frozen in the data instance powers the entire interaction. This is what Framer uses to re-render overrides and update the preview. If we comment this out and try using a plain object instead, we'll see that clicking on the freeze card button has no effect. The value is updating, but the override doesn't know. This is why it's essential to put any state that could change into a data instance. Another benefit of using data is that it preserves the value across renders. Let's take a look at our bar chart code component and see why this is important. In another video, we made this bar chart code component. It's a customizable chart where we can change the color, number of bars, and the thickness of bars. The bar heights are determined at random. This component has one flaw though. When we generate the random bar heights, we do it every time the component re-renders. During the preview, it's unlikely to change, but in the editor, it regenerates the bar heights if we change the color, the bar thickness, or even as we resize it and move it around on the canvas. So how do we fix this flaw? We can't simply generate the bar heights outside of the component because if we rely on the number of bars, what we can do is to use data. This is a piece of state in our component that changes, not often, but it does change. We'll start by importing data from Framer and creating an instance like so. This is where we'll store the random bar heights we get from our get bars helper function. You'll find this function in the utils file if you're following along in the template. This hasn't changed much. We're still randomly generating the bar heights, only now it's stored in the data instance. I'm going to add a small piece of logic. I only want to regenerate the series of bar heights if the number of bars has changed since the last render. Let's take a look at what we've achieved. We can now move the graph around the canvas and the data stays consistent. Changing the color, width, or size doesn't randomly regenerate a new graph. The only thing that changes the data is number of bars, which makes sense. If we change from 10 to 20, we don't know what the next 10 numbers should be, so we need to get a new series. Let's move on to our send money screen. Let's make this screen more interactive. I want to be able to select a person and send them some money. I also want the button to show how much money I'm sending and to which person. There are a few challenges we'll need to tackle to make this happen. First, let's look at what we're going to change. We already have a data instance, which is storing whether the input is valid or not. This gives us the validation feedback if the user puts in a character instead of a number. We'll expand on this with three more pieces of state, how much money we want to send, the index of the person we're sending, and the name of the person we're sending the money to. Next, let's start updating the state. We'll begin with the input error override. 
you'll notice that our onChange handler already sets data.isInputValid. Let's also store that value so we can use it later inside our button. Speaking of the button, let's take a look at the override for send money button and make use of data.money to send. For now, we'll return a different text property. Let's take a look at the preview. We can see that if we type in a valid number, the send money button updates with the value. Now we can address the person we're sending to. Let's make three overrides to handle this logic. They're all pretty similar. We start with defining on tap. It stores the person's index, either one, two, or three, and it stores their name. To provide the person with some feedback on which person is selected, we'll also adjust the opacity. Using the data.selectedPerson, we determine who is selected for each override. I'm using an index and not the name here, just in case I want to update the names and I don't want to replace the name throughout the code. We've stored the data, so let's go back to send money button and use the person's name in the button. There are a couple of improvements we're going to do to enhance this experience. One is navigation. We navigate to the send money screen from the home screen. And once we send money, we should send the user back there. We're going to destructure the use navigation hook to pull out the go back function. If we put in an invalid amount, haven't selected a person, or there's no money to send, we'll disable the button and set the text of the button to send money. If everything looks good, we'll change the button text to say send the money to send to the person you've selected. So send 80 pounds to Siri, for example. When the user presses the send money button, we'll call our new helper function, reset money data. If you're following along in the template, you'll find this function commented at the top of the file, which will reset the values back to default and will make use of the go back function to send the user back to the home screen. Let's test it out. We'll go back to the preview and try sending 45 pounds to Siri. We hit send and a push back to the home screen. There you have it, a working send money view that feels authentic and really brings a prototype into a class of its own. Now, we'll take a look at the final scenario. A common UI paradigm in many mobile apps is the master and detail view. Essentially, when we tap on a transaction from the list, we expect to navigate to a more detailed view, showing us more information about that particular transaction. I have a transactions code component that navigates to the detail view, but it always shows the same information. Let's take a look at how this component is constructed, and then we'll see how we can connect the detail view so that it makes use of the data available. First, we'll take a look at the utils file to have a look at the transaction data. Each transaction has a name, price, color, and icon. The transactions data is stored in a data instance. To render the list of transactions, we map over them and render a line item for each one. The line item component simply renders the data it's given. We could drop this component onto the canvas and modify it using property controls, but we can also use it in code and pass the props we want into it that way. Now we know what the data looks like and how the component works. Let's take a look at the detail view itself. I want to identify what parts of the view can change and create an override for each one. The main areas of change will be the name, the price, the icon, and the color of both the icon and the background hero. We'll need to create overrides for all of these. But how will we know which transaction the user has tapped on? We'll use a simple technique that we've used before. When the user taps on the line item, we'll set an index that we can use to find the particular transaction. As we map through the line items, we'll pass a callback which uses the index of each transaction. We'll update on tap line item to set the index before navigating to the detail view. Now that the setup is done, we'll need to retrieve the transaction based on the index. Let's write two helper functions to make it easier. You'll find these in the utils file if you're following along in the template. Get active transaction will return the transaction at the index which has been set. Get active price will use the active transaction but split the price into two parts so we can update the pounds and pence separately in the UI.
Now we'll start writing the overrides. For detail view name, we want to set the name to the text. We'll use our helper to get the active transaction and set the name. Detail view pounds is pretty similar, but this time we'll use our get active price helper and just take the first value of the array that's returned. That's the pound value. Detail view pence is almost identical, but we'll take the second part and prepend a decimal point. Detail view icon color will set the background color based on the icon color specified for each transaction. We'll also reuse this override to set the hero background color and the icon color, since the override changes the background color, which we want to be shared in the UI. Finally, we're going to create an override for the icon, detail view icon. This will modify a property which we haven't used before, icon selection. The icon on the canvas is an icon provided by the default framer components. I know it takes a prop called icon selection, because if you go into handoff mode and select the icon, you can see the code that generates it, and therefore we can see what props we can potentially tinker with when creating overrides. Now we've got our overrides ready to go, and all based on the transaction the user tapped on. We just need to hook them up. For each of the parts of the UI, we'll select the appropriate override. Let's see if it works. We'll preview the home page of the app and tap on a transaction. Sure enough, the view slides across to reveal the chosen transaction. Let's tap back just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. We'll try another one. Perfect. The color, name, price, and icon all change. This concludes driving prototypes with data. We've covered what the data instance is and when to use it, how to drive simple interactions with a data instance, updating a code component to use data and make it work more smoothly in the editor, and finally, connecting a detail view with overrides, a single data source, and child components. Thanks for watching. In the next video, handoff to frame emotion, I'll explain what happens after you've got a prototype and how to make the handoff from prototype to product as smooth as possible. Until next time, this has been Coding with Seth.